And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the madman behind things like Neurosity, Warpland, and Hell Knight, the latter of which is going to be the most important in, in this. And now, return, as well as the monk-themed card game Aset from a, while, from a while back, and now returning to the world of card games with Sigil, Beyond the Gates of Hell, the one and only Gabriel Kiryoga. I'm hoping I got it right <laughs> this time. <laughs> you got it right. Thank you, Mildra, for having me back into the monastery. Yeah. Also, the guy who keeps tormenting me with some of his cooking photos every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least uh, we, we love barbecues over here, so it's yeah. like uh, bar barbecues uh, every three days. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and you keep posting photos of, about it, <laughs> like you... Oh. Yeah, then, I, I think that I think that that's awesome. It's awesome that you find you guys find it like peculiar or weird, but I, I honestly, my friends uh, maybe eat much more than me in barbecues. They have maybe twice as much barbecues than me. I'm, I'm not even uh, 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 on the on the top. <laughs> oh, so, sounds like my kind of party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've. I'm certain. I'm certainly no. I'm certainly no stranger to that kind of thing. And well, if you've got if you've got a if you've got a giant thing for barbecues, it's it'd be a waste not to use it. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's uh, quite cheap uh, comparatively. So it's like you you make an event, and it's like a no-brainer to have a barbecue because it's much cheaper to to do that than anything else. Yep. But. With that now, with that said, Sid, as I under, as I understand it, Sigil is a card game that is set in the same universe as your as the Doombreaker RPG you created, Hell Knight. So, was that was this something that you were developing along the along the same time as you were developing Hell Knight, or was the pat was the origin for Sigil something that happened after the fact? I think that uh, one thing uh, eventually matched the other one. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of uh, Magic the Gathering, but I consider that that brand has lost its way. And I really don't like what's going on right now with, with the way they are handling their business. So I, I wanted to try that. I wanted to try my own, uh, my own way to do the mechanics. So I basically use a bit uh, like a bare bones or, or the skeleton of Hearthstone and, and Magic the Gathering and gave it a few major twists to see what happened. Uh, for example, we, we are using a, a shared uh, library, and a shared graveyard, and I'm uh, dismissing the whole lands thing. Instead of that, I'm uh, allowing that any card in your hand you can turn it into a sigil, which you can tap in order to generate foci, which is the energy used to cast the spells. And that, that turned turn out really good because it's like you, you need to decide which card to dispense in order to generate energy, and those cards, eventually you will need them. And at the same time, you have some spells that can uh, return those sigils to your hand or maybe turn it over and just cast them from, from the table. Um, the, the major, the major big difference or big mechanic that it was uh, a, a deal breaker or, or a game changer for me was something we're calling psycho pumps. Mm -hmm. That's basically an additional casting cost in the cards that um, they compel the player to do something live on the table. For example, maybe a card uh, asks you to tell a, a, a dirty secret you have that nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Or maybe what was your last dream? Or maybe sing a song or uh, burn something, turn on a light. Uh, some things are pretty easy to do and some, pre uh, some things are pretty challenging. And uh, you have to decide if you are willing to do that, to cast a spell and to win a game. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it was very interesting to, to break that fourth wall. I'm always looking to break that fourth wall in my games. Yeah. And from my perspective, whenever narrative is mixed with mechanics, that's always going to be an interesting thing instead of having them be divorced from each other. And when I yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess Absolutely. the best way for me to describe it is I, I like to view it as a yin-yang thing where one's feeding into the other. Ah, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I wanted to and I wanted to reinforce the aspect of, of assuming the, the, the Warlock character you are interpreting and fighting against your opponent. Uh, you can also do pacts or alliances mm -hmm. between each other in order to defeat a, a, an opponent that is uh, uh, perceived as being... Uh, uh, close to winning, uh, so I, I'm really happy about about that that game. Uh, and, and yes, it's immersed in Hellnight universe. It's like a spin-off, and it, it makes perfectly sense within the whole setting. Uh, basically, the premise is uh, you are interpreting warlocks trying to hunt uh, uh, and to gather the lost pages of a, a dark grimoire which holds the power over uh, demons in hell. Mm -hmm. So all, all the all the sorcerers, all the dark sorcerers, dark practitioners in the '80s world are fighting each other in order to get those pages, and the pages represent the grimoire on the middle of the table. Yeah. So it's a really, really good game. Yeah. It does not last very long, 25 minutes. Um, we have been playing it just before our sessions. Uh, we have fun. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. Yeah. Now. Of course, I, of course, I couldn't help but notice that in in a certain in a certain way, the visual motif of the of the cards is reminiscent of a lot of tarot cards that I've seen. I, f I feel like that was by design. Oh, of a lot of terror. Yeah the 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 way the the way the cards are formatted reminds me a lot of ter of tarot cards. What is tarot cards? Oh. Uh -huh. Though, though that, you... might just, that might just be my own ba my own background putting th putting things together, but I would like to kind of go into the anatomy of the, of of a given of a given card, um, and mm -hmm. for the purpose of this, I'm going to be using the um, image of the Slayer card that's on the Kickstarter. So mm -hmm. you you let let me know if I let me know if there's any parts that I miss. So obviously you've got the yeah. name on the top. Right under that, yes. I'm guessing, is the psychopomp. In this case, say something badass. Um, exactly. On the on the right side, on the right side is going to be the type. So yes, before the entity. The entity is the card type. Yes. Yeah. So I've on the page I've seen entity, I've seen ritual. What are what are, are those the two main types, or are there other types? And we, we, we have entities that are uh, like your creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, we have artifacts. Uh, no, I mean, we have relics that are like your artifacts types. Mm -hmm. We have rituals uh, that work pretty much like uh, sorceries. Mm -hmm. And you also have curses that, you, that are enchantments that you put on another player and they hinder the player in some way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, th those are the basic uh, four types we have. Yeah. Um, on the on the left side, there's a number. I'm guessing that's the foci cost. Yes, exactly. Right, so for the slayer, you'd need to you need to, you need to generate four foci to spend to bring it out. Um, yes, correct. The below that is going to be the effect, if anything, and on the on the bottom, mm -hmm. and then the very bottom is the fla the flavor text. And yes. I'm guessing the number in parentheses that you have on the bottom left corner is meant to represent the, um, I guess, strength. The, the, I guess strength. the power. It's it's like the power of the of the entity itself. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of damage it causes and the amount of damage it can receive, like a, a like a strength and life, uh, uh, all in two, all in one. Mm -hmm. Which, I'm de I'm definitely down with that. So. Yeah, it's, I... it's a very, I, I mean, if you are vaguely familiar with uh, trading card games, it's, mm -hmm. this one is like a no-brainer to, to understand. It's like very easy to understand. I am a big fan of easy mechanics and flexible mechanics, so I wanted to develop something that I can teach a, a noob, 
and uh, the, the play testing was I, I always do the play testing with half of them are noobs in that yeah. because I like to to propose the game to people that are not from the community itself which I, I can understand because you because um if you if you're just focusing on the, on people who are already familiar then you can ha then it can skew perspective I've seen that plenty of times yeah yeah yeah. I don't think I don't think that the psycho pump mechanic has been seen before. At least I have not seen it, uh, yeah. or maybe it can exist in in other games, but not not sure about the card games. Maybe I, a variation of it. Um, I think I've se I think I've seen something like it in in say, but it's been in the domain of party games, like say Cranium. Uh huh. Not necessarily mm -hmm. a full on. Car card game in the traditional sense. Now, when it comes to how turn order is supposed to work, I'm guessing it's a case of draw a card from the deck, place one place one um, card in your hand as a as a sigil and you can play as many cards as you can pay the cost for. Is that yeah. more or less how it works? Yes, very easy, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that is is it a case of a is it a case of a five or a seven hand um, draw at the start? It's a seven. Uh, uh, you start with seven cards mm -hmm. in the game. Yeah. And well, as you said, as I said, uh, we share the same deck. So one deck is good for two players. And if you get the expansion, uh, you can play with up to five players. Yeah. And that is good because I remember when I would play, when I would play Magic and similar games and I would try and have... Like um like th like three way or f or four way matches or or just multi person matches, we were mm -hmm. able to do it, but I'd hesitate to call it elegant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it could get a little bit chaotic at at um worst, or you or you'd have cases where so, where um some effects we did not know how how to how to make them work. Um, simply, be simply because of the fact that it wasn't really built for that. It was built for one on one, and we're doing something it wasn't designed for. Ah, yeah, yes, yes, Whereas, I understand. Though, though, I do want to highlight the f the fact that every card doubles as its card and and the equivalent of a land, because that ends up avoiding a problem that Magic has had for well, always. I'd say since then, I'd say since it's, day it's one. built into it's built into a system, yeah. Yeah, and the the problem is that the problem rears its ugly head in two forms. And you're prob you're probably familiar with both of these terms: mana screwed and mana flooded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to avoid that completely, uh, for sure. I I never liked that aspect of the system, but I understand that it's part of the randomness of the game itself that gives a chance to to a player that maybe does not have the power level of the other one. Yeah. But uh, I, I just wanted to make a game that was uh, um, balanced for all the players. Yeah. So everyone has basically the same chance, but at, at the same time, there is a lot of randomness involved. Mm -hmm. And I think that it highlights the fun aspect of the game instead of the competitiveness of yeah. it. And I am I am guessing I'm guessing that things like um, would. You know how you know how there's a how there's almost a met almost a meta type within uh, magic known as permanence for cards that are on the table instead of just used and discarded. I'm guessing mm -hmm. the, I'm guessing the main equivalent to permanence would be would be relics and entities. Uh, yeah, curses are also permanence on the game. They they stay. All right, that ma that makes sense. Yeah, and what. Do what is usually the st the starting amount when it comes to life? Given how you're trying to go for a very a very um, qu I won't say quick, but a very but a, a, a brisk kind of game. Are you going for like ten it's, life, or are you going for twenty? No, we're, we're, we are starting with twenty one life because I like the number twenty one. I have always liked it, mm -hmm. but um, I think that we are concentrating in. In that um, aggro is not such 
the, uh, uh, be the, the only way to win or, or the only strategy to win. So maybe you can win uh, through other ways, you know, doing some direct damage or maybe just flooding the opponent with curses or uh, causing, causing uh, some other types of damage, not, not just attacking with your entities. That would be too easy to me. I mean, you have pretty big, powerful entities, but uh, there is always another thing going on. And there are very weird mechanics. For example, you can inverse turn order or you can exchange your hand with your opponent's hand. Those type of things that do not usually happen in Magic, or maybe they used to happen in the beginning, but uh, then it uh, started to, to change a, a bit again. It, it became too competitive. Mm. At least that, that's my vision. Yeah. Something, something that I always find interesting go, going back and looking at, um, at, the, at some, of the early some of the early design concepts with Magic was... Andrew Garfield saying that he wanted a deck of magic um, cards to be the to be the equivalent of a character sheet in D and D, which <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how successful that was when the, when martial characters can do more in magic than they could in AD and D. Yes, I'm going there, <laughs> but there but there is that idea of de of developing a playstyle, and since you have Think, since you have things a bit shared, I'm guessing that that meant that some of the more specific types of card effects would not would not have fit. Um, which which type of card effects, uh, Mildred? Um, more more For ones example? more ones that would be, that would build on would build onto other effects. A lot of a lot of decks in Magic began developing um, combination strategies. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm, gu I'm guessing there's not a, there's not as much in sigil because of the shared deck kind of thing. I, I mean, the, the, the deck has a lot of synergy, and I think that uh, you you learn that many cards uh, work very well with each other, and there are a few hidden combos combos uh, going around, but but they are not like the main premise, and they are not absolutely necessary to win. Uh, so, yeah, that, for example, another, another thing that happens with the deck is that um, there, there are many cards that make you draw. So, so in order that it does not happen, the same thing with Magic, where you suddenly are out of hand. So I wanted all, all the time to players to have uh, many cards or many options to, to have. But uh, what that uh, causes is that eventually it can happen. There is a, uh, a chance that... Uh, you can uh, draw the whole library. You, you can end the library. And when that happens, it causes like a, a, like a sort of apocalypse. And each player, each uh, warlock will lose damage equal to the amount of sigils they had created. So creating sigils can also be a danger for the, for the wizard. Like too much power, it, it can eventually cause damage to him. So that's another way to kill your opponent. Maybe you, you end up, you want to draw quickly the whole light, the whole grimoire so you can cause that damage again to the to the opponent. Maybe he has eight sigils, you could cause eight damage directly to him. And then the the limbo, the limbo that's called the graveyard, will shuffle back into the library. Mm -hmm. So it's like a loop. It causes a loop. Um, that's also very appealing. I, I like that very much. Like, like another way of, of winning of a strange effect you need to consider when when creating sigils. Yeah. And, of course, because of the setup that's, th that's there, um, the, the, le the, level of the level of prediction that you can have with, with how you'd be planning it, how you'd, you'd be playing ahead, isn't going to be as present because the card you may be hoping for, somebody else may, have, may end up snatching it since, since the deck is shared. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, cause... and and there is there is like one weird counter spell uh, in the deck also, so mm -hmm. you never know if uh, if anyone has it. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there equ are there equivalents to instance? Um, you know, car um, cards that could be played outside of your turn, or is that not a thing? The only the only exception is the counter spell. The, the rest the rest of them the only things you can do you can like tap your relics or your entities in your opponent's turn or tap your silence in the opponent's turn 
and, and cost something uh, and, and do some interaction. But I did not want to emphasize the instant too much because uh, I, I think it gets complicated for noobs uh, mm -hmm. for, for the game. Uh, it's a great aspect of the uh, of the complex uh, of the complexity of the system. If if I have instants, you you get to the to the stack. You need to understand the stack too well, and it always like uh, causes some discussion. Yeah, and I'm also guessing that th that um there's no there's no relics that are th that are there just to make just to make um make make um make, make creatures or or anything like that. Yeah, uh, for example, there is a relic that whenever an entity dies, you create a zombie. Mm -hmm. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, there, there are many relics that uh, create a creature. They can turn into a creature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's always very like weird. You no, know? I, I did not want to do uh, simple simple things. I wanted to surprise you with the effect and with the psycho pump yeah. and with what the card does. And I wanted to provide like rituals or 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 courses that have a a game-changing effect. So maybe you, you think that somebody's winning and suddenly, bloom, uh, you lose your whole hand or maybe the, the player uh, controls your entities. Uh, it's always changing. I wanted to, mm -hmm. the, the power to fluctuate a lot. Yeah. And with the, the thing, the thing that, I, the thing that was in the back of my mind is whether or not some, whether or not somebody could do a certain combination and all, and all of a sudden you have the um <laughs> you have the, you have the sliver problem because you you probably have suffered through sliver decks at least once <laughs> uh, in which sense because of being overrun by entities or yeah these i've i've seen sli i've seen sliver decks and i've seen other types um create the, create the in create the insanity that that is a Zerg rush in in card form, you know, with just swar just having so many cheap monsters that no matter how no matter how many somebody's got fielded, there's it's just a battle of attrition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I as I said, I I made a point of not um, focusing on aggro, no. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to to give power, but not so much uh, in just raw aggression because uh, it's not that much fun. I, I, I want them to win in other, in clever ways. Which definitely makes sense. Yeah, so, yeah I think it, it works, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, <laughs> you so you're kickstarting two um, items um, for, for this. One of them is the Mirrored Reality, which is the core deck, and then a expansion beyond the gates of hell um, yes and one of the things that I one of the things that I noticed in the description for beyond the gates of hell is primordials what would that entail compared to the other types of cards you have available it's a big extremely big creatures uh, that have high cost six or seven in cost in foci cost um, they have a very big power and you can also tap them to cause uh, real uh, game game changer effects. For example, maybe you tap them and you draw three cards, or maybe you tap them and you destroy an entity, or maybe if they die, they blue, they destroy all the relics. They are like uh, uh, very difficult to cast, but uh, when they cast them, they they are a big threat to the opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit of an inspiration behind the. You remember the old legendary dragons in, in Magic that were yep. like very weird and they have a lot of abilities and it was <laughs> very, very strange. Well, I wanted to do something like that, but from the Sigil standpoint. And I think the Primordials are a big... Uh, uh, they, they appear in the Hell Knight setting, they are described, and I wanted to use them. Mm. I always wanted to use them. Yeah. And the... when it. The big rule back then with legendaries was just that you could only ha you could only have um, one of them active. Period. No, nobody else could have another one, another one active. Mm -hmm. That that tended to not have as big as big of an impact, anyways, just because of how many unique cards there are. But mm -hmm. I can see that having a much bigger part to play when the deck is shared. 
Yeah, it usually does not happen. Uh, there are ways to copy your creatures or to create a clone of that creature, mm -hmm. uh, but usually it does not happen. Uh, I, I did not want to complicate things by adding the legend rule, to be honest. Uh, so I did not think it was important to, to use that. Mm -hmm. That's completely understandable. And yeah. I, I need to simplify the game, mm -hmm. no? As, yeah. as much as I as I can, as I could. Well, how? Just out of curiosity, how long do you for, do you foresee an average an average game of sigil between two people going? Maybe twenty minutes. Yeah, usually twenty minutes. Probably thirty or forty if you've got four people involved. Yes, yes, that sounds uh, very correct. It can stretch for much more. Eh? It can stretch for much more, or it can end much quickly. It depends on on the amount of card draw when it happens. As I said, some cards are like uh, each player draws one card for each entity in the game. So suddenly, maybe all the players draw eight cards, and then you're out of the grimoire, and everybody suffers a lot of damage, and you mix the limbo back into the grimoire, and everything starts again, but everyone is down to three or four life. So uh, that sort of thing can happen and can speed up the game drastically. Wait, so have, having more entities allows you to draw more cards? Is that what you're saying? No, that, 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 that's, that only happens on a specific ritual. That was just an example. It can also happen that uh, maybe you have a, a relic that makes you draw cards, or maybe uh, there are many ways. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, fo foci generators, uh, many relics that generate foci and rituals that generate foci. So maybe uh, a player can, in the second or third turn, uh, create a lot of stuff. There is a very big, powerful ritual on the expansion that causes that all your sigils are turned over and cast. And maybe you have like nine sigils mm -hmm. and you cast nine spells. But then you're out of sigils to generate foci. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, with the with that in mind, what's the in playtesting? What's the largest amount of players you've had for you've had for one game? The largest, I think, it was uh, six, but it was too much of a stretch. Yeah, I could it was see. too complicated. Yeah, because I think that what complicated the most was the psycho pumps themselves. Because everyone is begins to drive crazy because all, all the all the things that people are doing, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe there is a spell that says uh, you need to crawl around the table and then you need to disappear. Another one has to start dancing. Or it, you need to switch places with the other player. Uh, you need to get somebody a drink. Or <laughs> it starts to get very loopy and. Uh, you start to lose sense of the game itself just to have fun of what everyone is doing. Mm -hmm. That can happen. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could certainly see that getting cha chaotic, but at the same time, it's, it's not like that's something you don't invite. No, no yeah, yeah. I think that you want the the, the game to be like be reasonably uh, sort of competitive. Uh, five players is uh, good, good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with expansion, but that's the one. But uh, you can certainly play with six uh, and still uh, play a long time, and uh, you won't be out of cards. It has uh, with expansion is 112 cards. It's uh, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no and, and all of them, and all of them are spells because when you think about 100 cards in a deck with magic, you know that maybe 40 percent is lands, and in this case, it's just spells. So it's like a lot. Mm -hmm. And with the even, even and that's even if you put put in put in the expansion as well. So, what would you be shooting for as far as a release win release window? I know print. I know printing these kind of things can be its own particular pain, but what would you be shooting for as far as a ballpark? I am hoping it won't be that difficult because uh, the, the game is pretty much designed and all the cards are designed. I just need to maybe hire some more artists for the artwork, um, polish a bit uh, some of the texting and, and, and do the editing. 
Uh, but I will be using uh, drive-through cards, and I have used that uh, before with Asset, my previous Monk game, that reminds me of you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that should be pretty easy. Uh, it's not uh, that, 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 that longer. That it does not take that much time to use drive-through cards. Mm -hmm. Should be pretty easy. And I think that in two or three months' time, uh, everyone should be able to enjoy the game. Yeah, I can oh, oh, certainly get behind that. Also, it will be available in Exalted Funeral. Mm. Uh, they have already um, they have already confirmed that they will be buying a uh, hundred decks. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, no, I, I can get I can certainly get behind that. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. No, thank you. Thank you, Midra. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I'm very sad that we did not talk about Fulci more. <laughs> we started talking about uh, Lucio Fulci and we did not yeah. have that, that conversation. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I'm sh I'm sure I'm sure the opportunity will co will come. I just it's just a matter of patience. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we need to make a um, a podcast exclusive exclusive about Giallo yeah. in general. And talk about uh, a bit of Dario Argento as well. Yeah. Um I think I think it would be tricky to do it just on Giallo. Um but po but I could I could certainly reserve an episode t talking about the the weird and wonderful world of exploit of exploitation cinema. Oh. <laughs> okay. I think that I think like there's a lot of stuff in Jalo, but as far as whether or not it's an, enough to sustain to sustain a whole show, that's another matter entirely. Yeah, um, yeah. If you're if you're a fan, I think there are a lot of movies. Yeah. yeah. I am. I I'm a fan. I'm a fan of storytelling as as a whole. Um. Oh. Mm -hmm. But and uh, it has a, such a, a such a nice and precise aesthetic that well, I just love it. You know, as you said, Lucio Fulci, the, the photography is like mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. But with and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! Mm -hmm.